Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. Uh, this morning, we're going to be looking at Paul's prayer to the Ephesian church. Uh, over the past several weeks, we have been looking at uh, salvation. We've been looking at how God redeemed us in the past and how he is working out our salvation now. And we looked at our inheritance of those who are saved. And so we're going to be looking at this prayer. And it's a fantastic prayer that Paul prayed for, for the Ephesian church. So let's just look at Ephesians chapter 1. And we'll start reading in verse 15. Ephesians 1, starting verse 15, says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you have which he called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incorruptible great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the highest, in the right hand of his heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Before Paul gets into his prayer for the church, he praises them for their genuine faith. He gives two signs for genuine faith. First, a right understanding of salvation. And second, he praises them for their love for all the saints. He praises them for their love for the church. A proper understanding of salvation starts with a biblical view of salvation. The Ephesians knew that their Savior was Jesus Christ and that they had faith in him, believing in salvation through grace in him alone. They didn't add or take away from it. And that's what we have been talking about over the past several weeks, the importance of understanding who saved us and why. It's important to understand, and the right understanding of that leads to the second part, which is our love for the church. One of the immediate results of saving faith is a love for fellow believers, a love for the saints, a love for Christ's church. Again, I remind us that the church is not a building. The church is not a bunch of programs or events. The church is a group of people, a group of local people who get together to bring worship to God and to honor Him. Church is people. 1 Corinthians 13 is oftentimes called the love chapter. If you've ever read it, you'll, you'll remember it as love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. right? And, and you've read this, and you've probably heard it a number of times at weddings, and it's talked about in the, in the context of romantic love, but actually... The love chapter in 1 Corinthians 13 is directed at a church. It's directed at people. It's exhorting the church that this is the kind of love they are to have for each other. You'll also recall that Jesus said that in this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. One of the definite signs of saving faith is a love for the church. Now true spiritual love is defined as an attitude of selfless sacrifice that results in generous acts of kindness done to others. Now, this kind of love doesn't come naturally. It's something that has to be worked at, and it has to be acted out. Paul praised this church for their love, but later on in Revelation chapter 2, John, in writing a letter to the Ephesians church, has scolded them for their lack of love. So it seems that they had started well, it seems as though they were still doing a lot of the programs well. They are doing a lot of things well, but they still seem to have forgotten what got them there, which is love and service. So important within a church for it to be known for that the people love each other. In the remainder of this chapter, Paul prays for the Ephesian church. He prays for them. And ask God to open up their understanding of who he is. Paul prayed that they would be spared from frantically searching for what they already have. But that they would understand that God would open up their minds to what he has already given them. 
The story was told me about William Randolph Hearst. He's an incredibly wealthy man in the past. Mr. Hearst read about an amazing piece of art, and he commissioned one of his agents to go and try and find this piece of art. He wanted it at any cost, he said, no matter what the cost, I want this painting for myself. Well, after months and months of searching, the agent came back to him and said, Mr. Hearst, you already own this painting. You have owned it for years, and you stuck it in storage in one of your warehouses. So many believers search for what they already have. They are searching for more than just an ordinary Christian life. They want more of Jesus, more of the Holy Spirit, more power, more devotion, more blessing. They want a higher or a deeper life. They think if only we can find the key or the right combination of spiritual disciplines, then we will finally reach this great plane. What we need to realize, and what Paul prayed for them, is that there is no amount of religious duties that we need to complete. There is no second rite of passage. There is no ritual we must do. No special second blessing of the Spirit, no mystical experience we must have. There is no merit or amount of self-denial that we must do. What we lack in spiritual wisdom to know is that God has already worked all these things out. He has worked it out in his plan, his power, and in who he is. The first thing that Paul prays for them is that they would understand the greatness of God's plan and salvation. In our North American culture, when we were to talk about our seat of emotions or our feelings, we talk about our heart, right? Our, our heart feels. Well, this wasn't the way that the Hebrew mind worked. In the Hebrew mind, a person thought with their heart. Their, their heart was a place of understanding, of thinking, of wisdom. And they had uh, their feelings came from their bowels or their guts. It's, it's where we get our feeling, or our word gut feeling from. The first thing he prays for them is that they would be enlightened about the greatness of God's plan and salvation. That they would understand that God had elected them and redeemed them and made them new. And that he had given them a seal in the Holy Spirit and that there is an inheritance that is yet to come. That they would understand the salvation. And this is what we've been talking about over the past several weeks. The greatness of God's plan and salvation. The second thing he prayed for is that they would understand the greatness of God's power. Paul didn't pray that they would receive more power, but that they would understand or be aware of the power they already possess in Jesus Christ. Later on in chapters 4 to 6, Paul admonishes them or tells them how to employ this power towards faithful living. Sometimes as believers we are tempted to doubt God. That God could bring about all these different things. We look at all the things that we have in Christ. And if we realize all that it took for him to save us, we would never doubt his power. We would never doubt who God is and what he has done. And then to top that up, he gives us opportunities in our lives to prove him faithful. Again, how many of us could tell stories of how God provided for us? How God worked out things? How God's plan was great and how he cared for us and provided for us. I could personally tell you a number of stories of how God provided for our family. Be it through finances, for things like car bills or dental bills, or, or even in years past to even have enough groceries for food. In this church, we have seen him provide the resources we need, again, financially to do the ministries and building projects. He's provided the people the gifts and the talents to make this church possible. We have no grounds ever to doubt God's power at work in his people or in his church. In verses 21 to 23, Paul prays that they would understand the greatness of God's person. Again, this is a matter of perspective. Isn't it? Each of us will have struggles and hardships. We all deal with different things at different times that, that bring us down or discourage us. But in how we deal with them is really a matter of perspective. If we look at them and see that only they can affect how they affect me, myself, and I, 
we will struggle with. If you look at how they affect me, if all I'm thinking about is me, my hurt, my struggle, these hardships grow bigger and bigger. But if in the midst of this struggle, in the midst of the hardship, if we think about the greatness of God, the vastness of God, then we can say what Paul says, that we can go through this hardship at all only for a little while. It's only temporary. Hardships and struggles are only temporary. They can't last forever. If instead, when things are hard, if we spend time praising and worshiping God, instead of dwelling on the hurt, if we dwell on the power, the majesty, the holiness, the greatness and purity of God, what it does is puts that problem in perspective. He says that Christ is our fullness. He is our all in all. It is with Christ that we have this intimate relationship. It is hard to imagine that we, as created beings, could have a relationship, a friendship, with Jesus Christ. And that I have a relationship with him is boggles the mind. It puts everything else in perspective. So where does that take us? What is the application for today? This same great prayer needs to be prayed for our church as well. That God would give us the wisdom and insight to understand just how great he is how great his power is, and how fantastic his plan was in redeeming us. Proverbs says that knowledge is the beginning of wisdom, and we need to know God more. The more we know of him and what he has done and what he is doing, the greater our devotion to him, the greater our desire to love each other, and, and the greater our desire to serve him and to serve the church. Your homework for this week is... It's pretty straightforward and it's pretty simple. Now that the weather has turned warm, now that things are getting nicer, I encourage you to go outside. Let the sun shine on your face and to take some time to meditate on God's plan for salvation. To just really let it soak in what God did and what it took for him to save you and to redeem you. To think about and to marvel at his power. To marvel at his character. And who he is. Things are a little different these days. It sometimes seems a little harder to, to praise God in the middle of, of the struggle that seems to be facing our world. But I think as we spend more time concentrating on him, remembering him, thinking about him, it'll put all of these things into perspective. We're going to close in prayer. And I just encourage you to please take some time to meditate on who God is. Lord God, thank you for redeeming us. Thank you, Lord, for making a way for us to be saved. Thank you for giving us the church. Thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to know you. Thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us, not only in your creation, but through your word and in a relationship with you. Lord, this week, I pray, Lord, that you would give us a desire to, to just take time to worship, greatness of who you are. Thank you, Lord, for this time we could have together. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, and we're dismissed.